Good afternoon. My name is Candace, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the Managing Comorbidities in PD Patients Diabetes Conference Call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star the number one on your telephone keypad. If you'd like to withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Thank you. Ms. Vallejo you may begin your conference. Thank you so much, Candice, and hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the latest session of the DaVita PD webinar series. This covers the key clinical elements of managing patients on P and is recommended for all DaVita medical directors, nephrologists, and nurses who have or plan to place patients on PD. This is a great mix of physicians and DaVita teammates, and we're so happy to see that there's such growing interest around the therapy and that all of you have made time in your schedule to join us today. For those who are in attendance, you are eligible to receive one continuing education credit for today's presentation, as one credit for each of the previous webinars in the current and the past series. PE credits will work a little bit differently this time. Instead of an evaluation, you will actually take a post post-test is based on Dr. Bargman's presentation, so please do pay close, pay close attention and know that the webinar is recorded, so if you do need to go back and watch it, you can, you can do so. Under uh, this session, like I said, and all of our sessions are recorded and available for on-demand access, and you can access them on this website, kidneyport.webex.com. Sometimes we'll reference previous webinars and the current ones, so feel free to go back and watch the past ones as you, as you need to. Today's presentation will include a Q&A session at the end. You can ask questions in multiple ways. You can wait until the end of the presentation and ask your questions in person, or you can type them into the chat box of your webinar panel, and we'll go ahead and ask them for you. As I said, today's topic is managing comorbidities in PD patients, and we're talking about diabetes specifically today. And now I'll go ahead and pass it on to our very own Dr. John Moran, who will introduce today's speaker. John? Thank you, Mel. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Bargman. He's a staff nephrologist at the University Health Network and professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. She received her MD cum laude from the University of Toronto and was an exchange student in Melbourne for her senior medical residency year and then pursued nephrology training at Stanford University. Her research focused on renal physiology and micropuncture. Upon returning to Toronto, she was recruited to the Toronto Western Hospital where she trained in peritoneal dialysis under Dr. Demetrius Oriopoulos. She has given 550 invited lectures internationally. This must be number 551 <laughs> on subjects as diverse as peritoneal dialysis, glomerulonephritis, and management of systemic lupus erythematosus. She is current director of peritoneal dialysis for the University Health Network in Toronto and co director of the combined renal rheumatology lupus clinic for the University Health Network. She won the silver shovel given by graduating medical class of the University of Toronto to the best lecturer in the undergraduate years. She also won the University of Toronto Faculty of Medicine Postgraduate Teaching Award, given to the best teacher in the postgraduate program. Recently just chosen as the 12th Robert Collins Visiting Lecturer in Dialysis at the University of Colorado in Denver. In 2013, she will be the recipient of the Donald Selden Award for Excellence in Nephrology at the National Kidney Foundation. Bargman is co-author of the chapter Chronic Kidney Disease in the 17th and 18th editions of Harrison's Principles of Internal Medicine. And our personal note that I have never seen so many fulsome assessments of lectures as I've seen of Dr. Bargman. So, Dr. Bargman, please take it away. Thanks a lot, John, and uh, that was and I love that was a lovely introduction. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody who's listening. I was asked by Myla to talk about uh, diabetes and patients on peritoneal dialysis, and this is actually a new talk for me, and I learned a lot while I was preparing this talk, and I hope that you do also. So, uh, this is obviously my talk and uh, at arm's length from uh, anybody uh, at DaVita. Here's the outline of the talk. I'll talk briefly about what I call glucose loading. 
chondroitin, which is the glucose that the patients absorb across the peritoneal membrane from the dialysis uh, fluid, and what the downstream effects of that is. The glucose both uh, in contact with the peritoneal membrane itself and then traversing the peritoneal membrane and going into the systemic circulation and the consequences of that. Then uh, we'll turn to more practical issues like how do you control the blood sugar in diabetic on PD and how can we reduce that, that glucose loading? What 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 have in 2013 to try to uh, affect that uh, constant glucose uh, traversing into the body? And then some other issues that I wanted to discuss having to do with the diabetic patient on PD. So this is from the United States uh, Annual Data Report. This first uh, one is about incident, which means new patients coming to dialysis by their diagnosis. So this is all dialysis. And if you can see the cursor here, you can see uh, this is the number of diabetics going on to uh, dialysis. And this is the second one is the rate of end-stage renal disease. And you can see that there was really an explosive growth of end-stage renal disease in diabetic patients going on to dialysis. And this has plateaued somewhat. So the incidence or rate of end-stage renal disease hasn't really decreased, but it's plateaued somewhat. Here's the next slide, which now looks at prevalent diabetics. So those are the number of diabetics or percent of diabetics at any given time. And you can again see that there's, because these diabetic patients are living longer, although the incidence has plateaued, because they're living longer, there's actually a continuing number of diabetics on our end-stage renal disease program. And this, as I said, for the United States Renal Data System, although we see similar numbers here in Canada. So this is really a, a big issue, diabetics, and I'm sure any of you who work in dialysis units know that, you know, if not the majority, the close to the majority of the patients who come to you, the cause of their renal failure is some combination of diabetes and hypertension. So what about peritoneal dialysis and the glucose absorption from the PD procedure itself? It's known just from measuring this that up to 80% of the glucose that's in PD fluid can be absorbed across the peritoneal cavity into the systemic circulation. And just how much of that glucose that's absorbed depends on a couple of things. One, the transport type. And so-called high transporters or rapid transporters will absorb more glucose in a given well compared to the lower or slower transporters. The thing that affects the amount of glucose absorbed is the strength of the dialysis fluid. And then we just know from measurement that a 4.25% solution, about 45 to 60 grams of glucose can be absorbed with each well. But you'll see the strength goes from a 4.25 to a 1.5, that there's less glucose absorbed, of course, because there's less glucose in the solution to start with. If you said every gram of glucose has about 4 calories per gram, that comes to a daily absorption that can vary anywhere from 400 calories up to about 1,200 calories a day for someone who's a rapid transporter using the more hypertonic solutions. So just remember, that's like a big honking piece of uh, chocolate cake with uh, fudge on it, that 1,200 calories. It can really be really quite significant. So this shows different transporters and the different kinds of solutions, with the light blue being the 1.5 and the sort of teal color being the 4.25 percent, and certainly in a low transporter, there, a low transporter will absorb more glucose from a 4.25 percent solution compared to a 1.5 solution. But if you go up to rapid or the high transporters, this differential between the 1.5 and the 4.25 is even more dramatic, and the rapid transporter will really absorb a lot of glucose from a 4.25% solution. And again, if you say that each gram is about 4 kilocalories, you can say that is, this would be over 300 calories worth of glucose just from one exchange. You can see that glucose absorption is really quite significant. 
what effect does it have on the metabolism? We know that in people on peritoneal dialysis, there is an increased prevalence of what's called the metabolic syndrome, which is a conglomerate of uh, insulin resistance, uh, lipid abnormalities, and so on. We all know, and I'm sure many of us have seen this, that so-called borderline diabetics who, before dialysis, are reasonably controlled with diet only, will often become overtly diabetic once on PD, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen, that diabetics who were reasonably controlled on oral hypoglycemics, sometimes those oral hypoglycemics don't cut it anymore once they go on PD, and they have to be switched to insulin, and that can certainly be a source of uh, dismay to many of our patients. And of course, diabetics who were already on insulin counter the increased glucose absorption, often have to increase the dose of insulin that they're taking. So one study, and there's a couple, that looks at the metabolic syndrome in patients on PD compared to pre-dialysis and, and hemodialysis patients. And I just want to focus you on insulin resistance, which is one of the facets of the metabolic syndrome, and show you that this was much more prevalent in patients on peritoneal dialysis compared to either hemo or pre-dialysis patients. Now, there's an interesting study from Hong Kong that looked at patients who uh, were not known to be diabetic, went on to PD, and became diabetic, so what's called new onset hyperglycemia. And interesting, you can see these different uh, survival curves here. Certainly patients who were already diabetic had the worst survival, which every study shows. But what was interesting was that the uh, stress, if you like, the glucose stress of the PD solution, when it made some patients diabetic, and here's the group that had new onset hyperglycemia, they had a worse survival paired to the patients who remained non-diabetic. So these two groups are basically the new onset hyperglycemia, and it seemed to be a marker for worse survival, although not as bad as pre-existing diabetes, but worse survival than those patients who did not become overtly uh, diabetic with the institution of peritoneal dialysis. Now, glucose loading in patients on diabetics does lead to increased insulin requirements. Again, those of you who look after diabetic patients know that this is usually the case. And this is just another study out of Hong Kong that show, for example, the amount of insulin used when the patients use just one 2.5% exchange per day, um, with the others being 1.5, that there was an increase in insulin requirement. They had to use two 2.5% exchanges. There was even a greater increase in insulin requirement, presumably driven by the increased glucose loading from those two more uh, hypertonic solutions as part of their PD regimen. What about glycemic control in the diabetic patients? There's one study, um, I think out of the DaVita database, that looks at glycemic control, and it's a U-shaped curve. So certainly diabetic patients who had very low blood sugar had an increased risk of mortality. And this probably chooses for patients who are wasting and not eating. And uh, you know, we know that they never have a good prognosis. If you look at the patients who were progressively more hyperglycemic, you can see that, in fact, uh, there was an increasing mortality no matter how you adjust the statistics for worse glycemic control. And it really seemed to become, to me, more clinically evident when the sugars started to go above 200. So I think that's an important point, too, and we'll come back to that when we talk about the uh, KDGO recommendations, because you can see the patients who ran around 150 to 200, at least to my mind, really didn't have a sizable increase in mortality. But, you know, according to the analysis of this data, if the hemoglobin A1C was greater than 8 or the fasting sugar more than 300, there certainly was an increase in mortality. So, you know, the magic number, at least from this particular analysis, appears to be around 300 milligrams per deciliter. The really interesting study, too, that looked at hemoglobin A1C levels in non-diabetics. 
And even in non-diabetics, and you can see the hemoglobin A1C is divided between greater than or less than 5.45, which is essentially normal. But non-diabetics who had a hemoglobin A1C more than 5.45 had a worse survival compared to the group that had an absolutely normal hemoglobin A1C. And these are in a whole cohort who were not diabetic. So that's really interesting suggests that this concept of subclinical diabetes may even uh, figure in our PD patients. Now, another downstream effect besides the glucose absorption and the uh, new onset or worsening of glycemic control is the lipid story. And known for years, ever since there have been comparative studies of lipids in patients on PD compared to hemodialysis patients, that the lipid pattern in PD patients is quite different. There is hyper, there's increase in serum triglycerides. The DL cholesterol, which is the good cholesterol, so-called, is lower in many studies in PD patients compared to hemo. The LDL, or the bad cholesterol, is higher in PD patients compared to hemo. There's an increase in what are considered to be very atherogenic particles small, dense LDLs. In my mind, these small, dense LDLs are the ones that burrow into the uh, vascular endothelium and set up the uh, atherosclerotic lesions. But it's known that these small, dense LDLs are really quite atherogenic, and studies have shown that they're higher in PD patients compared to hemo. And also the lipoproteins and the apolipoproteins are also higher and presumably worse in PD patients compared to hemo. So it's interesting because sometimes when I talk about residual kidney function and how important it is for survival, I say, well, you know, residual kidney function is so much better in PD patients compared to hemo. And sometimes the question I get is, and then why don't PD question, why don't PD patients live so much longer than dialysis patients? And it's probably because there's other stuff going on in PD that counteracts the uh, potential benefit of the ongoing better residual kidney function. And one of those counteracting factors may be, who knows, but may be this very atherogenic-looking lipid pattern. Here's another uh, study that looked at lipid levels comparing pre dialysis to hemo to pineal dialysis and, and you can see that the, the pattern in the B patients tends to be more atherogenic with like again a lower uh, HDL, a higher LDL and so on compared to the hemo and the dialysis cohorts. So when do these patients on PD get all these lipo lipid and lipoprotein abnormalities? It's pretty complicated, but again, it's probably related to this continuous glucose loading in the PD patient. Insulin resistance, I showed you that there was this higher incidence of metabolic syndrome with insulin resistance in the PD patients. And another interesting theory is as follows. We know that patients not on dialysis who have nephrotic syndrome do have very atherogenic uh, lipid profiles. And the theory is that the protein loss from the urine stimulates the liver to pour out these uh, abnormal lipids and, and lipoproteins. And one has made the comparison with PD, where in fact you do get loss of protein every day from the peritoneal dialysis fluid. So the liver doesn't know if the protein is being lost from the kidneys in nephrotic syndrome or from the peritoneal cavity in PD and responds in the same way with this outpouring of lipids and lipoproteins. So the PD in a way recapitulates nephrotic syndrome and that may be another contributor to the dyslipoproteinemia in patients on peritoneal dialysis. Another thing too is that all the uh, sugar and advanced glyco and all the sugar in the PD fluid, perhaps with the help of the glucose degradation products that are in the PD fluid, can also affect the peritoneal membrane itself. And this is a study that looked at the peritoneal membrane in uh, pathology specimens. And just to show you, even patients who are not yet on peritoneal dialysis, patients 
patients who have diabetes have different looking peritoneal membrane compared to non-diabetic uremic patients. And you can see that the peritoneal membrane is on average more thickened in the diabetic uremic patient compared to the non-diabetic uremic patient. This has nothing to do with PD because they're not yet on that therapy. And here's this is just looking at the blood vessels. Again, more abnormal looking blood vessels in diabetic compared to the non-diabetic even before they're on peritoneal dialysis. So uh, that just shows you that that diabetes itself may make the peritoneal membrane more abnormal even before it's exposed to the glucose intrinsic in the PD fluid. How these are studies, uh, this comes out of Belgium, that looks at the deposition of what are called ages or advanced glycosylation end products in the peritoneal membrane. And uh, these advanced glycosylation end products are felt to be mediators of a lot of damage that is seen in patients with diabetes. And it has been proposed that at least at the level of the peritoneal membrane, even if the patient themselves is not diabetic, that peritoneal membrane is seeing so much glucose that it really sort of, again, recapitulates diabetes at the level of the peritoneal membrane. In other words, if you're the peritoneal membrane and there's all sugar inside the peritoneal fluid that is crossing, it's like you've got local diabetes, even if the patient itself uh, is not diabetic. So maybe that's the reason why, whether the patient is diabetic or non-diabetic, there is a deposition of these advanced glycosylation end products in the peritoneal membrane itself. And it's been postulated, although to my mind not really proven, but it's been postulated that this deposition of these end products in the peritoneal membrane may lead to progressive uh, dysfunction of the peritoneal membrane over years. And maybe it's what accounts from patients pretty late in the game developing ultrafiltration failure because the deposition of these advanced glycosylation end products related to the glucose in the peritoneal membrane. So that there's been a move to try to uh, get non-glucose or reduced glucose uh, uh, peritoneal dialysis solutions, try to, and I say quote unquote, protect the peritoneal membrane, perhaps by reducing the amount of uh, age deposition. But again, it's not known whether that will pan out, although I'll show you some interesting studies looking at glucose-sparing peritoneal dialysis regimens. It shows you the hemoglobin A1C and what kind of mean plasma glucose it translates into. Hemoglobin A1C is a reasonable, although not perfect, measurement of uh, continuing glucose control in patients on uh, dialysis. Now, this can increase the hemoglobin A1C related to the blood sugar is actually something called carbomylated hemoglobin, which is seen patients have a high urea, and that can artificially increase the hemoglobin A1C. The other thing is that patients on dialysis, because they've got reduced red cell survival, the red cells don't hang around as long as normal, and therefore they don't get that much glycosylation on the red cells, which is what the hemoglobin A1C measures. It's sometimes called glycosylated hemoglobin. In other words, for someone who's on dialysis and has a hemoglobin A1C level of 8, their day-to-day -day blood sugar control is not felt to be as good as a non-dialysis patient who has a hemoglobin A1C of 8. So in fact, it does underestimate, the hemoglobin A1C does underestimate a little bit the overall glucose control. However, it's still a reasonable test. It's it's easily gotten uh, everywhere, and different recommending bodies have said that if you have a diabetic patient who's on dialysis, you should measure their hemoglobin A1C at least twice a year, if not more frequently. And certainly in my PD patients, measure the hemoglobin A1C uh, every two to four months as an index of glycemic control. So how can we control the sugar in our diabetic patients on peritoneal dialysis, and what can we do to reduce all this continuous glucose loading in those patients? Strategies is 
to reduce the need for ultrafiltration. If a patient has a less demand for ultrafiltration, it means that they don't have to use such strong PD solutions, such as the 2.5 or the 4.25% uh, solutions, and therefore will get less glucose being absorbed in return. So the patient needs less ultrafiltration in the first place. That will be one way to reduce glucose loading. How can we reduce the need for ultrafiltration? Well, the patient should eat less salt and water in the first place, and that's something we tend to forget about. But dietary salt and water restriction will really reduce the need for ultrafiltration. Diuretics will uh, get the kidneys to pee out more salt and water, and therefore the patient will need less ultrafiltration. And later, Repeatedly, we try to preserve the residual kidney function because if the patient has more residual kidney function, maybe they need less peritoneal dialysis to achieve their uh, clearance and ultrafiltration goals. Plus, we know, as I mentioned before, that there's something good and anti-inflammatory about having ongoing residual kidney function. So, we put, here's our patient. They're the black box. The intake into the black box, which is, of course, salt and water intake. And there's the output from the black box, which is in volume and ultrafiltration. So if there's less intake, there'll be less need for ultrafiltration. If there's increased urine volume, there will be less need for ultrafiltration. And less need for ultrafiltration means less exposure to these glucose-containing PD fluids. do reduce uh, the need for ultrafiltration insofar as they increase salt and water excretion from the kidney. A couple of studies suggest, have suggested that the diuretics do not actually change the kidney function in terms of the glomerular filtration rate, but they do increase urine volume. So this is one study that was a randomized controlled trial. They took PD patients who had about a liter of urine per day, and one group did not get diuretics. The other group got 250 milligrams of Lasix or furosemide every day. The group that did not get diuretics lost about 300 mils a day of urine volume over the following year, whereas the group that got the furosemide kept their volume over that year. There was no difference in glomerular filtration rate after one year between the two groups, but you can see that there's greater urine volume. So this 300 mils extra that the group on furosemide had after a year is 300 mils that didn't have to be ultrafiltered with the peritoneal dialysis process itself. So what I do is I explain to the patient uh, about getting the kidneys to pee out salt and water rather than by dialysis. And although our patients are not thrilled about taking more medicine, I think they kind of understand that. I think they understand about the benefit of peeing out the salt and water rather than doing it by dialysis. If you use furosemide, and I'm not a pharmacologist, but I think because furosemide really has a duration of action of only a few hours, and only give it to them once a day, they may have a diuresis for a few hours, but then for the rest of the day, the kidneys will try to make up for it and reabsorb salt and water back into the body. So I would recommend using a BID or twice a day regimen for furosemide, but with the proviso that you don't give the second dose just before bed. Because, of course, if you do that, the patient will be up all night peeing. And if they're on a cycler, they're not going to thank you for that. So usually I prescribe furosemide, and I'll give one dose in the morning. And the second dose, again, every patient's different, but maybe no later than 3 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon so that the effect is gone by the time that the patient goes to bed at night. Metolazone is a thiazide-like diuretic that works when the glomerular filtration rate is very low and also can be given, but again, it should be given in the morning. Some people are excited about spironolactone uh, because of its uh, potential of, uh, effects on cardiac fibrosis, but I personally am scared until I see more evidence about giving a potassium-sparing diuretic to a patient who has very little kidney function because of the risk 
of hyperkalemia. There are studies that go either way about that, but I personally am scared about it. And indeed, the only patient I've had on PD who had emergency hyperkalemia that they had to go to the intensive care unit was one who was on spironolactone, not for this, but for polycystic ovaries. But it really did scare me, and I'm, I'm reluctant to use the potassium sparing diuretics. Of course, to preserve the residual kidney function, you want to avoid nephrotoxic drugs, and that includes anti-inflammatories, prolonged courses of aminoglycosides, if you can get away with a less nephrotoxic kind of a drug. Avoiding dye studies if possible. For example, instead of a coronary angiogram, could a patient get a dobutamine stress echo instead? If the patient has to get uh, uh, a, a dye study, treat them just like you do your pre-dialysis patient and stop the diuretic, use the least amount of dye that you can get away with. If you believe in N-acetylcysteine, then use that. So to avoid dye studies if you can. The other thing I get asked about a lot, too, is the use of ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers. Many patients in their course of progressive chronic kidney disease will eventually be taken off these drugs because of hyperkalemia. Is there any benefit to putting them back on ACE inhibitors or ARBs once they go on to peritoneal dialysis? There were two randomized controlled tri trials that looked at this. This one out of Japan used uh, Vsartan, and they found at the end of, of uh, one year and again extending to the senior year that there was about a mil per minute better preserved GFR in the group that took Vsartan. And you can see also in the bottom panel that there was better urine volume in the group that took the angiotensin receptor blocker, the Valsartan, compared to the control group. And the same sort of study with Ramapril. And again, this is the uh, residual GFR, glomerular filtration rate, to show you at the end of one year that the group that took the Ramapril, again, had about a mil per minute better preserved GFR compared to the group that didn't take the ACE inhibitor. So there may be a role for ACEs or ARBs in renal protection and ongoing preservation of residual kidney function in our patients. And this isn't necessarily specific to PD. This may also apply to our hemodialysis patients, too. It's just really, uh, it hasn't been examined as rigorously as it has been in the PD population. So the bottom line with preservation of residual kidney function in the patient on dialysis is to treat them just like you would a patient who was pre-dialysis. And like you would make sure they don't get dehydrated, you would try to not to give them aminoglycosides or other kind of nephrotoxic insults. The same thing goes for the dialysis patient with residual kidney function. What about these so-called glucose-sparing PD regimens? So there are solutions that aren't based on glucose as the osmotic agent. And that includes, of course, icodextrin, which is a glucose polymer, and also glucose solutions that use amino acids as osmol instead of glucose. Using either one of these solutions will reduce the total amount of glucose that is absorbed. So dextrin, as you know, is a, a collection of polydispersed dextrin dextrin molecules in the PD solution. There is no glucose or dextrose in the solution. And uh, icodextrin works just like, like I, you know, the story of the hare and the tortoise. So the hare ran quickly out of the gate, but soon grew tired, but the tortoise was slow and steady. And although the hare was winning at the beginning, the tortoise just kept on and eventually won the race. And really, the tortoise is the icodextrin, and the hare is the dextrose. These are ultrafiltration curves over time, and you can see for the first 10 to 12 hours that if this is the 4.25% in the purple, that there is rapid ultrafiltration, but it soon dissipates after about 6 to 8 hours, and you start to get progressive reabsorption, whereas icodextrin which is the light blue here, over the long course has slow and continuous ultrafiltration. And that's why it's really like the tortoise rather than the hare. Now, this idea of uh, the ultrafiltration 
efficiency ratio, which is really saying how much ultrafiltration bang do you get for your glucose buck or for your carbohydrate buck. And the idea here is that icodextrin leads to more ultrafiltration per gram of carbohydrate absorbed. Icodextrin is still a carbohydrate. It's just not glucose. Uh, the carbohydrates here are maltose and maltotriose, and they do get absorbed into the body. But icodextrin still, for the amount of carbohydrate absorbed, gives more ultrafiltration compared to a 4.25% solution. So these studies, this is comparing to a 2.5% percent solution. You can see this ultrafiltration efficiency, mils of ultrafiltration per gram of carbohydrate absorbed, that icodextrin was more efficient compared to 2.5 percent. The same thing goes for a 4.25 percent uh, uh, PD solution. So great ultrafiltration efficiency, more ultrafiltration for the uh, carbohydrate uh, uh, absorbed. And this, again, just puts it another way, better ultrafiltration efficiency uh, compared to the 4.25% solution. Another benefit of icodextrin is that rather than the glucose hit of the rapid absorption of glucose with the trospace solution, that uh, icodextrin gives a more gradual glucose curve in the patient, and therefore you don't get a big reactive surge in insulin when you use icodextrin compared to the dextrose-based solutions. It's all very nice, but do the so-called glucose-sparing regimens using icodextrin, using amino acids, do, do they lead to better glycemic control? And the results are really quite variable. Many centers, mine included, looked at uh, hemoglobin A1C levels in patients who were either on icodextrin or amino acids. But remember, too, that this is usually just one bag out of all the bags that they're using. So dextrin is only licensed for one bag a day. So that means that the other bags have to be usually uh, glucose-based. So the amino acids only licensed for one bag a day. Again, it means that all the other bags are dextrose-based or icodextrin, and therefore maybe that's why we haven't seen dramatic results. But those were really quite variable, varied from center to center, and there was no rigorous study to really look at that. So this one study, again, it was a small number of patients, but they actually had patients who were assessed with an indwelling uh, um, glycemic monitor and they compared patients who were on uh, amino acid and uh, dextrin compared to the usual dextrose-based solutions. And you can see that this is the, glu the uh, glucose uh, levels in the blood from moment to moment. And in the patients who used the usual dextrose-based regimen, that they were really very shaky or all over the place. And this is in the patients who used instead two N and dextrose-based ones, but instead an amino acid plus an icodextrin. So again, a regimen with two usual dextrose, but instead four dextrose, there were two dextrose, one amino acid, and one, one icodextrin. And this moment-to-moment -moment monitoring showed a, a more stable blood sugar level compared to the dextrose base, where you get those hits with rapid absorption of uh, glucose. We just finished uh, a randomized control trial in centers around the world also looking at this. So we want to see whether if we use the glucose-bearing regimen would actually affect the hemoglobin A1C. So the control group got, again, all four dextrose uh, bags. The glucose-bearing got either two biocompatible physiomeal or two dextrose-based uh, solutions, and the other one was amino acids and icodextrin. So this was the glucose sparing regimen, one or the other, and the control was all dextrose-based solutions. And this is the result of the hemoglobin A1C. If I show you over here, this is the control group. You don't see anything here because there was no change in hemoglobin A1C after six months in the control group. But the group that had the glucose sparing regimen had about a 0.5.6 reduction in hemoglobin A1C after six months. And the lipids, 
you would suggest that maybe the lipids might change with a glucose-sparing regimen. And in fact, there was a statistically significant decrease in triglycerides, VLDL cholesterol, and this lipoprotein, which is felt to be very atherogenic, apolipoprotein B, was also reduced. Anything below zero means that it fell compared to the control group. So significant reduction in several important uh, lipids also. So here's the triglycerides. The gray is the control group. It did fall a little bit in the control group. I don't know why, but it fell even more in the group that had the glucose-sparing regimen. LDL cholesterol fell a little bit in the control group, but fell more in the glucose-sparing regimen. And here's that ApoB, which actually went up in the normal control group, but fell in the glucose-sparing regimen. So this was a randomized controlled trial, over 200 patients, and it showed that what you put into the peritoneal cavity can have an effect on the downstream parameters. But we didn't look at things like cardiovascular events or anything like that because a six-month study wouldn't expect it to have those kinds of outcomes. So really, the importance of this particular study was to show, like I said, the what you put into the peritoneal cavity can have an effect on these metabolic uh, endpoints. I just want to close by talking about some other uh, management issues about the diabetic on peritoneal dialysis. What about diet? Should we give them carbohydrate restriction? I don't think it's really so uh, important. I think it's just important that these patients eat what they want. Remember, they're getting up to 1,200 calories worth of carbohydrate from the PD solution. So whether they take more or less dietary carbohydrate, I don't really know if it's going to make a gigantic uh, difference to these patients. We should limit the use of hypertonic solutions, like I talked about, and all these different mechanisms to do that to encourage the, the, a reduced need for ultrafiltration. I think also, if you can, to try to get a diabetic specialist involved with your patients, because uh, as you know, many of these patients use us as their primary care physician, and we can forget about things like that they need checkups to about diabetic retinopathy, or importantly, that they know about foot care. I want to show you this study. It's a little bit old now, but it's really quite dramatic, and we were able to get funding for a drop in our dialysis program. And the addition of the chiropodist led to a reduction in amputations in diabetic patients. So this shows uh, the number of serious foot problems after the, we got the chiropodist. And you can see it, there really wasn't a change in the number of incident foot problems in our diabetic population. But the darker bars here are the drop in the number of amputations. And in our analysis, the things that predicted whether a patient would come to amputation, of course, older age, peripheral vascular disease is a no-brainer, cerebrovascular disease, but the use of a chiropodist was associated with a dramatic reduction in the need for amputations. So thankfully, we still have this uh, chiropodist. We were able to make a business case that amputations are very expensive to the healthcare system, and that alone more than pays for the chiropodist. Now, as soon as we see patients who do have some uh, foot problems, ulcers on their toes or something, they're sent immediately to the chiropodist who makes a decision about whether they need to go see vascular surgery, what sorts of tests they need, and so on. And thankfully, Amputations have become a very rare event in our peritoneal dialysis program. What about diabetic patients having more risk of peritonitis compared to non-diabetic PD patients? This is uh, one study that did find that there was an increased risk. Anything over one here means an increased risk of peritonitis. And having diabetes compared to non-diabetics was associated with a 13% increased risk of peritonitis. And this is uh, our own study of the Canadian, this is a Baxter peritonitis database. And you can see, interestingly, no matter which way you analyze it, that female but not male patients who were diabetic did have an increased risk of peritonitis. I don't know why in females but not in males, but they certainly did seem to have uh, an increased risk for this complication, no matter which way you sliced it uh, statistically.
A problem with diabetics is gastroparesis. And uh, this can be a very miserable experience for their patient. And there are a couple of studies that looked at gastric emptying time in patients on PD and compared, for example, this diabetics with the PD fluid in the abdomen, and this is the gastric emptying time. And when there, there was fluid in the abdomen, it took longer for the uh, stomach to empty compared to when the PD patient was empty of PD fluid. And there's another study that shows the same thing. So uh, it's been recommended that if the patient does have gastroparesis and you can swing it, that maybe they should take their meals with an empty uh, PD abdomen. Uh, and I found that it has worked rarely in some PD patients, but not terrifically. And it really hasn't been helpful over the long term in my PD patients with severe gastroparesis. You can use prokinetic therapy, including uh, metoclopramide. Uh, erythromycin has been uh, helpful, which is uh, interestingly. We've sometimes used intraperitoneal erythromycin. Uh, it's hard to get, and it, it can work for gastroparesis. And again, this may be another reason we want to involve a diabetic specialist who may have more experience with this complication than we do. My own take is that uh, if the prokinetic agents and you know, em eating empty and things like that don't help, do consider a switch to hemodialysis. And I've had a few patients who were pretty miserable with gastroparesis on PD who did feel better when they switched to hemodialysis. So if nothing else is working, you might even consider a trial of hemodialysis and see if it doesn't help the gastroparesis in this unfortunate subset of patients with this diabetic complication. Can you insulin via the peritoneal cavity? The answer is yes. In fact, the insulin that you give intraperitoneally is absorbed through the portal circulation to liver. Once that insulin reaches the liver, it decreases the glucose output, which lowers blood sugar. And in fact, when the pancreas itself secretes insulin, that's how it works. It goes through the portal circulation to the liver. So when you have IP insulin or no pancreatic secretion of insulin, it goes through the portal circulation to the liver and only then to the systemic circulation. Whereas when you give insulin subcutaneously, um, it goes directly first to the systemic circulation and then only then to the liver. So really, IP insulin, if you like, is more physiologic. Again, it's sort of recapitulating pancreatic secretion of insulin compared to the usual subcutaneous insulin. And there was a, um, there was a trend for IP insulin, especially when more patients were on CAPD, with studies showing more smooth um, control of blood sugar with IP insulin insulin compared to subcutaneous insulin. Um, now, what injecting insulin in the PD system, does it lead to increased peritonitis itself? And this is one study that suggested that it didn't, that patients who used uh, IP insulin did not have a higher incidence of peritonitis compared to diabetic patients who use sub-Q insulin. Now, are thinking about intraperitoneal insulin, about 50% of it will get stuck on the bag and the tubing. Therefore, you have to double the dose just to count for the insulin that's going to be lost being stuck in the bag. And um, as I said, it works nicely for CAPD. The problem is in APD. Because in APD, with more rapid exchanges, it's more complicated. And because glucose is absorbed faster from the dialysate compared to insulin, you'll get that sugar hit and get early hyperglycemia, but the insulin, because it's absorbed more slowly, will lead to late hypoglycemia. And so they don't match each other very well when you're using long dwells. And therefore, intraperitoneal insulin has sort of fallen out of favor with the increasing popula uh, popularity of APD compared to CAPD. However, if you do have a patient on CAPD, there is a recipe for this. It's very unscientific. But it works reasonably well. And basically, you take the total number of units that the patient is using, double it, and that's because 50% of it's going to get stuck on the uh, tubing, and then divide it among each of the four bags, 
if a patient's on four bags a day, but maybe give them a little more of that amount during lunch and dinner and a little less certainly before the overnight bag so you don't risk overnight hypoglycemia. And they'll all be that cheap, regular insulin. So if you have a patient here who's 42 units of Lantus and 18 units of Humalog subcutaneously, and you want to switch her to IP insulin, you would add 42 plus 18, which equals 60, double it to account for the 50% uh, being stuck to the tubing, and that comes out to 120 units. If it's four bags a day, that would be 30 units a bag. And so, again, you have to use your judgment, but maybe put more of that in the mealtime bags and less of it at breakfast and even less of that uh, for the overnight bag or none at all. Again, with anyone dosing with insulin, you never know what the right dose is right away, and it's trial and error, but at least this is sort of a, a starting point. I just want to mention, if you do have anyone on IP insulin, this interesting complication. We were actually the first people to describe it. But when you've got insulin in the PD fluid, which is shown in this uh, dark area here, the insulin actually crosses into the liver. It crosses the hepatic capsule. Very high concentration of insulin in the few layers of the liver can lead to fat formation. And it can become like a, it's almost like a steak. You can get sort of a ring of fat along the edge of the liver. And this is a very unique lesion and is only seen in diabetic patients who are using intraperitoneal insulin. It's called hepatic subcapsular steatosis. I want to point out the KDOKI uh, guidelines for the management of diabetic patients with chronic kidney disease. This is really essentially hot off the presses. I'm just going to pretty a couple of important points. So they recommend that a target hemoglobin A1C should be about 7, unless there's a risk of hypoglycemia or a of established comorbidity, in which case you can be a little more generous with the hemoglobin A1C and target something higher than 7%. An interesting recommendation is not to start statin therapy in diabetic patients on dialysis. This is all we talked about, about the abnormal lipid parameters. There's really very little evidence to suggest that de novo statin therapy changes outcome. I think what they're saying is if the patient comes to you already on statins, they don't have to necessarily stop it. But you shouldn't really feel compelled to start statin therapy because it's just one more drug for the patient. There's a risk of side effects, and it hasn't proven to be helpful. The insulins don't need dose adjustment for dialysis patients. The phonoureas should not be used in patients on dialysis. The generation cell phonoureas, you can see them here, can be used. Glyceride is supposed to be uh, avoided. Uh, we use a lot of glycoside here in Canada, but I don't think you have it. But here are other agents that you can use. Uh, they recommend that this glimepronide glyceride should be started at a lower dose. So no first generation sulfonylureas. You can use some of the second generation sulfonylureas. Uh, no metformin. You can be conservative with uh, prandin if you want. You can use the uh, glitazones, pioglitazone and rosiglitazone. There is this risk of heart failure, as you know, with the glitazones, but this is because of renal salt retention. So a patient who has very little residual kidney function, you don't really have to worry about kidney salt retention if there's no significant kidney function, so you can use them. And they recommend against the things like acarbose and uh, miglitol in our dialysis patients. The glyptids like Genuvia are okay to be used, but they have to be dose modified. And you can see, for example, with BFR less than 30, which of course goes for our dialysis patients, that's a much lower dose than the typical dose that is used in the general population. Those are the recommendations. Just to, uh, again, bring home the uh, important points, I showed you that diabetes remains a very important cause of uh, kidney failure, and many of those patients hopefully will choose to go on peritoneal dialysis. This close loading does aggravate uh, hyperglycemia, causes uh, hyperinsulinemia, and also lip hyperlipidemia. However, the clinical importance 
of metabolic abnormalities is unclear. It appears that all bets are off with dialysis patients in terms of uh, the lipid story. So we really don't know what this means, but certainly the lipids are, are really abnormal in the PD patient. So we could try to reduce these metabolic abnormalities, but not be too obsessive about it. And that's it, and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Barkman. Uh, I do want to give us a little bit of time for Q&A. If we needed to steal 10 minutes of your time, does that work with your schedule? Yes, it does. It does. Excellent. And Candace, our host, are you on the line? Yeah. And Candace, I needed to steal 10 minutes of your schedule. Would that work for you? Absolutely. Everyone, we will start our Q&A right now. You can ask questions in two different ways. You can, um, uh, Candace will let you know. Oh, you can ask questions, um, or you can type them into the chat box. We are going to go until 10 after, so for those that need to drop off, feel free. Those who can stay on, please do so. Do remember that the WebEx is recording. Candace, can you prompt for questions? And if you'd like to ask questions over the telephone, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Okay, we wait for those to be queued up. I'm going to go ahead and ask the question that is uh, typed in our chat box. First question is, any thoughts on the effect of glucose leading from a PD solution on serum uric acid as a marker of vascular injury? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, I'm not a uric acid specialist, but I think it's more a byproduct of protein metabolism rather than glucose. So I can't remember studies that have shown any kind of relationship between glucose and uric acid. There's like a fructose and uric acid story, but not glucose. So uh, certainly there are some interesting studies that show that serum uric acid is associated with poor, uh, poor uh, incidence of cardiovascular events in P patients, but I've, I've never seen a relationship with glucose loading. Thank you. And do we have a lot of questions? And we have no telephone questions. Great. Right. Another one? What choice of PD as renal replacement therapy modality in the first place? Is there increased mortality for uh, DM stands for, but for DM patients in PD as compared to HD? <clears throat> That's interesting. If you look at comparative uh, uh, outcome studies in many, but not all countries around the world, uh, you know, again, these aren't randomized trials, but just if you look at who's doing what kind of modality and, you know, what are their death rates, there really is a signal that uh, female diabetics, if they do PD, have a higher death rate than female, female diuretic, uh, sorry, female diabetics doing hemodialysis. Not so much for the males, but for the females. And it's really interesting because I showed you in the peritonitis literature that it's also the female diabetics who seem to have a higher incidence of peritonitis compared to uh, male diabetics. And when all this literature came out about uh, the higher death rate for female diabetics on PD, uh, everyone said that this is what it shows, but no one really had uh, an explanation why. And so we went back at that time and we looked at all our female diabetics on on PD in our own center who had died, just to try to get a sense of what they dying of. And in fact, interestingly, it really seemed to be a, a series of events that started with peritonitis. Get a patient, a female diabetic patient, usually this is the elderly female diabetic, they get peritonitis, they come into the hospital, they have an MI, they go into atrial fibrillation, uh, you know, and then it's sort of one event after the other, and they end up up uh, passing away during that admission. So it does seem to be peritonitis driven. Having said that, I would never deny a female diabetic who needed to do renal replacement therapy. I would never say to them, don't do PD because you have higher death rate. Same registries that show this higher death rate for the elderly female diabetic on PD also show, for example, a higher death rate for a 30-year-old male with IgA nephritis on hemodialysis. I wouldn't say to that 30-year-old male with hemodialysis, you should go on PD because you're going to live longer. You can't really make a choice of modality based on retrospective, non-controlled registry data. So yes, there is this signal 
know about something with an increased death rate in the elderly female diabetic on PD compared to hemo. I think it's peritonitis driven, but uh, I certainly would not use that in uh, counseling about modality. Thank you. And it's an elastic question. Thank you. We do have the question. Nellie Alcon, your line is now open. Hi, uh, this is Nellie Alcon. I just have a question. Do you advise then that all PD patients, whether diabetic or not, are supposed to get glucose level monthly for their labs and hemoglobin A1C for quarterly? I'm sure that Davida probably has protocols to this, and perhaps uh, John uh, can speak to it. In, in our own unit, as I said, uh, in our diabetic patients, we will monitor hemoglobin A1C. In the non-diabetic patients, we'll do it every six months. Oh, thank you. Another question here from the chat box. The hepatic ring caused by P insulin, is that a problem for the patient? It's a question. No, it's not associated with any abnormalities of liver function. But what I've seen happen and what I've heard from other people is that these people go for like an ultrasound or a CT scan for some other reason. And the radiologist who's not aware of this uh, lesion says, you know, there's something really bad going on in the liver. And then all of a sudden everyone's worried that this person has uh, metastatic disease to the liver. And so I just wanted people to be aware about this uh, thing. But no, it's not associated with hepatic abnormalities. It just may end up launching the patient onto a whole bunch of unnecessary investigations. Thank you. Can I have a question here? And we have no further questions. Another one from the chat box here. We recommend monthly glucose testing for all PD patients and twice yearly hemoglobin A1C on non-diabetics as well. At a twice weekly hemoglobin A1C, we do do even for the non-diabetic and more frequently for the diabetic. I don't think I would recommend monthly glucose for the non-diabetic, but again, I'm, I'm sure that Davida probably has some sort of recommendations about that. But just be aware that your so-called non-diabetic patient can theoretically become diabetic. So it's something that you should monitor at least at some interval. I'll read one more. We went on the beneficial effects of recent observational studies proposing losartan and how it can prolong the survival of the peritoneal functional clearance. So <clears throat> this is the idea that, that part of the pooping out of the peritoneal membrane over many years may have to do with fibrosis and stuff that's driven by the renal angiogram tensin system, and that may be another reason to suggest that ACE inhibitors or ARBs are good things is that maybe it will slow down this progressive damage of the peritoneal membrane. And it's very early days. There's some there's really early retrospective kind of studies that suggest that patients who happen to be on ACEs or ARBs have better long-term preservation of their peritoneal membrane compared to those who aren't. But uh, again, it's really not super strong evidence. But there is so much to encourage us to use ACEs or ARBs, including better preservation of the residual kidney function, perhaps, at least theoretically, better preservation of the peritoneal uh, function over many years. And we published a paper in, uh, in Nephrology Dialysis Transplant that showed that patients who were on an ACE or an ARB had a, had a about 60% reduction in mortality compared to patients who weren't on ACEs or ARBs. This is just a single center retrospective study. But all of these studies are sort of giving the same signal that maybe being uh, on ACEs or ARBs may be a good thing for our patients. Thank you. Candy, last questions? No questions at this time. Could I ask Dr. Bergman a question? quickly? Go right ahead. Uh, Dr. Bargman, is there any literature that speaks to the potential use of low-dose um, oral hypoglycemics like a um, thiolidine to lower the LDL in potential patients that are creating up, not quite diabetic yet, but are heading in that direction? 
That's a good question. I don't know of any. The the idea is that if you had better uh, glycemic control, would you um, would you reduce the production of the abnormal lipids? Right. That's that's the question. Yeah, I don't know of anyone who's done that in a sort of a prophylactic way. Thank you. Oh, one more question here. Do you recommend adding insulin to icodextrin? I think there's a problem with that. Great. Okay. Uh, another question here. I am new to working with PD patients. Do you know if someone is, or how if someone is a high transporter? Oh, the whole other talk. <laughs> a lot. Sure. Yeah, the, uh, you know, uh, they'll probably realize that uh, um, as you know, we do peritoneal equilibration tests usually after a month after the uh, PD catheter has been inserted, and that characterizes the transport status of the patient. So you'll know if the patient is a high transporter or not. Although often nurses get the sense of it even before they get the official PET test because how much the patient ultra filters uh, with exchange. Thank you. Any live questions? And we still have no questions. Okay. Another one here. What deal is the highest recommended dose for LASIK? Highest recommended dose for LASIK? Well, I'll tell you, my own comfort level is that we tend to go up to 120 milligrams BID, sort of our highest dose. But in the United Kingdom, they routinely use about 500 milligrams a day. And so, uh, you know, I, nothing to justify my own comfort level. Uh, I don't go above uh, 240, but like I said, routinely in the U.K., they use 500. So I'd probably, depending where you are, but uh, personally I would recommend 120 BID as the max dose, but I really don't have anything to justify it, and there's extensive experience with 500 uh, elsewhere. Thank you. Another question for a question either in the chat box or anyone who would ask, like to ask a question live. I have no telephone questions. I don't see any others here. Just so you uh, will know, the uh, presentation, like we said, is recorded and available for on-demand playback. Uh, so for those of you who uh, do have residual questions or, or want to look at something again, you can do so there. At this time, if there are no more questions, we'll go ahead and stop here. I would like to take a moment to thank everyone again for participating and to especially thank our speaker, Dr. Joanne Bargman, for taking some away from her busy schedule to speak with us today. Please be sure to join us for our next webinar that is scheduled for Friday, April 5th. We are covering new concepts in PD catheters and placement, and the webinar will be hosted by Dr. Crabtree. As a reminder for those nurses in attendance, you are eligible to receive one continuing education credit for today's presentation, as well as one credit for each of the previous webinars in this series or the last series. I do have the STAR Learning course code for nurses. That is C E C two one. Four eight. So Charles Edward Charles one four eight, and then it is a post this time and not an evaluation. So I hope everyone took notes. Hmm. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. And this Thank concludes you. today's conference call. You may now disconnect.